First of all, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, friends of the Institute, and Oliver Saxon, in first place. Um, I'm so happy and welcome you all here tonight. My name is Monique Knapen, and uh, as director of the John Adams Institute, I have the honor to open this lecture event. Tonight's a special night. We have been inviting Oliver Sex for several years, and you have played very hard to get. We're very, very honored you're here tonight, and although you're British by birth, we do welcome you here as a special John Adams Institute guest, and I think our audience will love you very much for that. The John Adams Institute organizes lectures and discussions with American authors and other prominent authors, uh, prominent Americans, sorry. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we have put brochures already on your chairs. And uh, if you're interested, please fill in the coupon and support our series. Before we really start, I would like to thank Oliver Sachs Dutch publisher Meulehoff and the book importers Van Dittmar and Nielsen and Lam. Without their support, we couldn't have made it tonight. In a moment, Ronald Plasterk will introduce Oliver Sachs briefly, and after his introduction, Mr. Sachs will give a talk for about 40 minutes, after which Ronald Plasterk will start a public interview with our guests. Due to time restrictions and logistics, we're afraid we cannot offer you the usual Q&A session after, afterwards. I'm sorry about this. We will, however, have the usual book signing afterwards, but I will inform you on that around 9 o'clock when we close up the interview with Mr. Sachs. Tonight's moderator is Ronald Plasterk. He's not only a molecular biologist and a director of the renowned Hubert Laboratorium in Utrecht, he is, amongst others, a famous columnist in the Dutch national newspaper, De Volkskrant, and the discussion program Buitenhof on national TV. Only yesterday he tickled us about privacy and DNA, and if you want to know a little bit more about him, actually all about him, look at the website of Buitenhof. You will be able to check on his DNA yourself. Anyway, let's go on to the core business for tonight. Very proud to have Mr. Plastak also here. Please, can you take the floor? Thanks very much, Monique. I must say I'm, I'm quite honored by the invitation to be the moderator tonight because it's, it's, a, it's a real honor and it's an immense pleasure to introduce our guest uh, of tonight, uh, Dr. Oliver Sachs. My only problem is, of course, that I'm introducing somebody who does not need any introduction for anybody here. So I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here right now. Um, the problem is that it's not only, I think, that, that all of you will know uh, Dr. Sachs because you've read one or two or three or four of his books, but um, at least what I experienced when reading his books was that sometimes if you read a book, you just read the book, but if you read the books of Dr. Sachs, you quickly get the feeling you get to know him because uh, the way of writing is such that what you actually see is you see the world through his eyes. So you feel you're on this side of the eyes. You're inside of his mind while you're looking at the rest of the world. And that sort of gives this feeling of closeness um, uh, which, which may not even be, be justified, but, but I think which, which all of us have af after reading these books. Um, Dr. Sachs is a, is a storyteller and a doctor. And I read in, a, in, a, in an interview that I, I, I've been reading quite a few interviews in preparation of, of tonight. Um, I, I also read in one of them that you find interviews are irrelevant, but I must say I was um, happy to read them after all. Um, that, that to the question whether you were a doctor or a writer in the first place, the, the answer was, I'm a doctor. Um, but of course, for all of us, uh, primarily, um, Dr. Sachs is, is a storyteller. When reading all these stories, and especially the book, the subject of which is going to be discussed tonight here, and that is the subject of the chemical boyhood. Um, so in a sense, that's memoirs, but from a specific angle. Um, I, I felt that it must be embellished. This cannot all have happened quite precisely so, but wherever I saw the, embellish em the possible embellishments, I had the feeling they were always adding to the reality. They were not, not reshaping the reality, they were just making it more real in a way, and, and I think that's, that's a real art, real art by itself. 
Um, of course, looking back on, on um, uh, what, what um, Oliver Sacks has given us as readers, um, I think it's primarily a view, of course, of the human mind. And um, that view, um, I'm not a neurologist, so I'm in no position to, to know how new that was in, a, in an entirely scientific manner. But I know that for the public it was quite new. And I think it's good to position that maybe um, between two alternative angles. And one is the one, of course, of the medical view of, the, of mental illness, where a mental illness was, was a disease and patients were seen as, as walking diseases. And the other one was the opposite angle, which became popular in the 60s and the 70s, of the anti-psychiatry. And I remember these posters on the wall that said, in, at least here in Holland, did you ever meet a normal person and how did you like it? Right? And, and the, the, the message was that it was good to be not normal. But, but I think that was a romantic view of what, what mental illness was, and it wasn't entirely fair either. And I think what, what, what the merits of, of uh, Oliver Sacks was that he, he's given us a view that in a way is in between, because he very strongly looks at the mental patient as a person, who is primarily a person uh, who, who, with feelings and who can be an interesting person by itself. But then the view on the illness was quite analytical and quite sharp. It wasn't just, hey, how great that you're not normal. It was really trying to, 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 to understand the disease as well. So it was both looking at, at the, the mental patient as a person, but also looking at the disease as something that was worth, you know, cracking your brains about, trying to understand what was going on, trying to recognize patterns there. And of course, he did make that transition of trying to understand the diseased brain as a way in trying to understand our, you know, I would say our brain as if we're not, you know, but, but the regular brain, the non-diseased brain, uh, but not by romanticizing it, but just by, by clearly analytically trying to analyze if this is the disease, then what does it tell us about how the brain functions? And I think that was a message that, that has certainly reached millions of people all over the world and that all of us have found, found very, very fascinating. Um, so today we're going to hear um, about the chemical youth of Oliver Sacks. Um, and I, I found it a fascinating book. Um, I've, I've read it recently, it's only come out a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a session here a, a few weeks ago in, in the Ridderzaal, in the, in, in the Hague, where, where a lot of uh, people met, so including the Prince of the Netherlands and a lot of industrialists. And the session was about the subject um, that we have a problem in Holland, and I think it's, it, it's, it's wider than that, in that not a lot of young people are attracted to science anymore that we have a hard time getting good PhDs and good graduate students, um, and that students seem to want to go to law school to become a lawyer and to make money, or to, to become an econo economist, but not a lot go to chemistry and physics and biology and all of these sciences. And, and the question was, what can we do about that? A lot, of subject, a lot of suggestions that were made were in the order of, let's give them a lease car, <laughs> right? So let's try to hire them if they become a graduate student in Holland, that's called an IO, an assistant in, in training. Um, let's give them a, you know, a mobile phone from the university or something to try and attract them. But I think that's, that's starting way too late because the real age at which you have to grip people, young people, and fascinate them for science is this, this Harry Potter age. Right, the age between 10 and 15 years where, 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 where little kids are opening up to the world and are recognizing all the wonders, all the miracles in the world and are realizing that there is an order where they, once, where they didn't see that order at first and that there are rules and there's almost magical rules and if you understand those rules you can, you can fly, you, know? you, can, you, you can rule the universe if you understand it. And I think that sense was very, very strong in this book in which, in which we read about how young Oliver um, um, was, was, um, was totally fascinated by, by the idea that you could understand the elements and therefore the stuff that this world is made of and that it was within reach for, for, for a young person. And uh, I think somehow, but it's maybe a sideline for tonight, somehow it's important that we keep getting our youth at that age and that the real problem to trying to get more PhDs in science is to get high school teachers or uncles or aunts, if you're lucky enough to have these uncle tungsten and, and aunts um, in, your, in your family or in your environment that can recognize that somebody is fascinated, fascinated by something in science and feed that interest. And it's an amazing series of characters that we've seen in this book of all these uncles and aunts that, that feed that interest and, and, 
um, um, indeed, I think, I think young Oliver Sacks must have been overstimulated with the world of music and science and religion and literature and, and, and I would drive anybody crazy, I guess, to grow up like that. But fortunately, that hasn't happened. So without further ado, I want to uh, uh, say, um, I think I speak on behalf of all of us here, that we're really happy that you want to be here tonight and share your thoughts with us and I'm really looking forward to your lecture, Dr. Sachs. Um, thank you for that, that um, really beautiful introduction, um, which at times was disquietingly acute. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure being here in Amsterdam again and reflecting that it is 50 years since I first came here. Um, some things are much the same. The Hortus, where I was this afternoon, has, hasn't changed too much. And um, uh, I can't, my pronunciation is bad, but, but Brutia van Kutia is, is still here. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it is, uh, I think it is still very much one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, the, uh, and I'm, uh, uh, I feel honored by being invited by the John Adams Institute, especially when I look at the roster of, of people who've been here before. Um, all of them I admire, um, and some of them are my friends, like Deborah Tannen, I think, who is coming later this week. Um, well, th um, this is a very different sort of book. Uh, my other books have been... Right, I, want to, I want to put a watch somewhere on a level surface, but I don't see a level surface. <laughs> um, incidentally, I got this watch in Amsterdam about 30 years ago. It's an old train watch. I don't know whether there still are trains in Holland or whether conductors still use watches like this. Um, well, um, My previous books, in a sense, are reports on uh, current situations with patients. Um, and on one occasion, a report on myself when I was a patient or a report on a community of people with a strange condition in a Micronesian island. Um, uh, I was about to start on another book, a book on aging, not just the miseries and diseases of age, but what I like to think of as some of the healths and delights of age at the end of 1997, when my attention was pulled in the other direction. It was pulled in the other direction by receiving a parcel from a friend of mine, a chemist, who knew something of my boyhood. And in this parcel, there was a huge periodic table. I was going to bring a periodic table with me tonight, and I was going to put it on the rostrum. I'm afraid I forgot. And um, I guess this one in my wallet is a little too small for you to, for you to see. I've carried a periodic table around for the last 50 seven years. Um, it also contained a small bar of a very heavy metal which fell down with a clonk and which I immediately recognized as a bar of tungsten because I had had an uncle who made lights with tungsten filaments and he sometimes used to give me bars of tungsten and he was really the one who first inspired me with a love of chemistry and metallurgy and he was very important in my life. And so I started by writing two paragraphs about Uncle Tungsten 
remembering his, his wing collar, his hands blackened with tungsten powder, and then other memories came up, and other memories, and other memories. So once the door of memory had been opened, everything flooded up. Um, but that little bar of tungsten was like Proust's Madeleine. It suddenly opened uh, at least a partly forgotten time of, of childhood and boyhood. Um, so this then is, um, this book is an act of recollection or of reconstruction uh, and as if you have suggested of uh, perhaps of embellishment or heightening in a way, uh, although I like to think that it's an embellishment or heightening in the, in the cause of reality. Um, in some ways, perhaps it, it may have qualities of an autobiographical novel. I have, um, uh, storytellers uh, always take liberties, they transpose a little, they heighten, they bring out some things, um, but I, um, I, I hope it's a, a fair portrait of a boy growing up nearly 70 years ago and uh, having a remarkable family, uh, being evacuated in the war, and then falling, falling in love with science. Um, um, this was an awkward book, or a strange book, to organize, because some of it is personal history, and some of it is the history of science, and especially the history of chemistry. Um, and I wondered, in fact, at one time if I was trying to write two books, but I, find, I found these two subjects indistinguishable, uh, and in some sense I actually felt that I was living the history of chemistry, because this was not a subject I did at school. I didn't start with a, an up-to-date textbook. I started with my 18th century uncles, and, uh, and sort of it went from there. Um, now, I think I'm going to read some sections from the book and fluctuate between reading and talking. Many of my childhood memories are of metals. These seem to exert a power on me from the start. They stood out, conspicuous against the heterogeneousness of the world by their shining, gleaming quality, their silveriness, their smoothness and weight. They seemed cool to the touch, and they rang when they were struck. I loved the yellowness, the heaviness of gold. My mother would take the wedding ring from her finger and let me handle it for a while as she told me of its inviolacy, how it never got tarnished. Feel how heavy it is, she would add. It's even heavier than lead. I knew what lead was, for I had handled the heavy, soft piping the plumber had left one year. Gold was soft too, my mother told me, so it was usually combined with another metal to make it harder. It was the same with copper. People mixed it with tin to produce bronze, or with zinc to produce brass. I knew zinc, the dull, slightly bluish bird bath in the garden was made of zinc, and tin from the heavy tin foil in which sandwiches were wrapped for a picnic. My mother showed me that when tin or zinc was bent, it uttered a special cry. It's due to deformation of the crystal structure, she said, forgetting I was five and could not understand her. And yet her words fascinated me, made me want to know more. I badgered my parents constantly with questions, although these tended to circle around my obsession, the metals. Why were they shiny? Why smooth? Why cool? Why hard? Why heavy? Why do they bend, not break? Why do they ring? Why could two soft metals produce a harder metal? What gave gold its goldness? And why did it never tarnish? My mother was patient for the most part and tried to explain. But eventually, when I exhausted her patience, she would say, that's, that's all I can tell you. You'll have to ask Uncle Dave to learn more. We had called him 
and called tungsten for as long as I could remember, which he manufactured light bulbs with filaments of fine tungsten wire. His firm was called Tungstalite, and I often visited him in the old factory in Farringdon and watched him at work in a wing collar with his shirt sleeves rolled up. During my visits to the factory, Uncle would teach me about metals with little experiments. I knew that mercury, that strange liquid metal, was incredibly heavy and dense, and that even lead floated in it. As my uncle showed me by floating a lead bullet in a bowl of quicksilver, but then he pulled out a small gray bar from his pocket, and to my amazement, this sank immediately to the bottom. This, he said, was his metal, tungsten. Uncle loved the density of the tungsten he made. He loved to handle it, the wire, the powder, but the massy little bars and ingots most of all. He caressed them tenderly, it seemed to me, in his hands. Feel it, Oliver, he would say, thrusting a bar at me. Nothing in the world feels like Sinter tungsten. He would tap the little bars and they would emit a deep clink, the sound of tungsten. Uncle would say, nothing like it. I did not know whether this was true, but I never questioned it. And of course, it was the sound of tungsten, the little tungsten bow I hadn't dropped, which started these memories. Now, at this point, if I were in the States, I would pull out a six kilo bar of tungsten I have and drop it on this platform. And if uh, any of you were not attending, you would certainly attend after that. But I, I didn't feel I could get it through security <laughs> in, in these days. Um, well, early days. In September 1939, the war broke out and parents in England were put under great pressure to evacuate their children something like four million, three and a half to four million children were evacuated. Um, sometimes this worked out well, sometimes not so well. Um, I was evacuated to a school in the middle of England um, where I think the, in retrospect, I think the headmaster was insane. Um, <laughs> Well, but you know, it's difficult for a child to make this judgment about an adult. I mean, adults are always right. And if I was beaten every day, uh, I felt this was because I was very bad and deserved it. I didn't, of course, realize that he was a sadist, or perhaps I did when I saw the smile on his face. Um, uh, and uh, there was a lot of bullying at the school, and we were starved. And above all, I was separated from my parents. Um, my parents were both doctors, they were both very busy in London, and I didn't see much of them. Um, things got worse and worse. Um, and one develops various psychological defenses in this sort of situation. Sometimes when I was being beaten, I would say to myself, He's only atoms. The headmaster is only a temporary vertical collection of atoms. And for some reason, this, um, uh, this seemed to make it easier. Um, I, um, uh, there was bullying among the boys. There was beating from the headmaster. One could only get away mentally. And for me, the mental escape and refuge was numbers. Um, I think I might um, read a little bit. I particularly loved prime numbers. The fact that they were indivisible, could not be broken down, were inalienably themselves. I had no such confidence in myself for I felt I was being divided, alienated, broken down more every week. Primes were the building blocks of all of the other numbers, and there must be I felt some meaning to them. Why did primes come when they did? 
Was there any pattern, any logic to their distribution? Was there any limit to them, or did they go on forever? They spent innumerable hours factoring, searching for primes, memorizing them. Um, I also had an aunt who was important for me, and she showed me that numbers sometimes entered uh, the construction of plants, and that if you looked at sunflowers or pine cones at the spirals, they had a particular, they fell into a particular numerical series, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, a f so called Fibonacci series. And, and she would show me the, the logarithmic spirals of ferns. And she would say, God thinks in numbers. Numbers are the way the world is made. Um, the association of plants, of gardens with numbers, assumed a curiously intense symbolic form for me. I started to think in terms of a kingdom or realm of numbers with its own geography, languages and laws, and even more of a garden of numbers, a magical, secret, wonderful garden, a garden hidden from, inaccessible to, the bullies and the headmaster and a garden, too, where I somehow felt welcomed and befriended. Um, uh, but um, uh, one can only get so much comfort from numbers, and in general, this school was a very bad situation. I never complained. My brother, who was with me, never complained. Everyone else complained, and one by one they were withdrawn from the school. I was the last pupil there, and then the school closed. <laughs> uh, uh, and then when I was 10, I came back to London to my parents, and I um, re-met my uncles. I should say that my mother was the, came from a huge family. She was the 16th of 18 children. And seven of the nine uncles uh, were associated with the physical sciences, with chemistry, physics, mineralogy, geology, one way or another. And two of them were very important. Um, uh, but um, I think before speaking of them, I'm going to give you a little um, completely irrelevant sort of interlude. Um, so I had just returned to London. I was at another school. And here, um, I was persuaded or forced, I can no longer remember, to join the Cub Scouts. I don't know if you have Cub Scouts here. You do. This, it was felt, would be good for me, would make me mix with others of my age, would, would teach me needed skills like making a fire, camping, tracking, though it was not quite clear how such skills would be deployed in urban London. And for some reason, I, I never really learned them. I had no sense of direction, no visual memory. There was some thought that I might be mentally defective. Fires I laid could never be started or went out within a few seconds. And my attempts at making fire by rubbing two sticks together never succeeded, though I was able to conceal this for some time by borrowing my brother's cigarette lighter and my attempts to pitch a tent caused universal mirth. Um, um, although I couldn't bring the tungsten bar, as I thought of, the, of trying to light fires, I couldn't resist uh, bringing, bringing this, although I think it was probably terribly illegal, and it's the sort of thing which a terrorist would, would have. Um, the, um, now, let me go back. Um, the only things I really liked about the Cub Scouts were the fact that we all wore the same uniform, which reduced my self-consciousness, my sense of being different, and our identification with the wolf cubs in the Jungle Book, a gentle founding myth that pleased my romantic side. But the actual scout life, at least, with me at least, continually miscarried in all sorts of ways. This came to a head one day when we were asked to make a special damper, like those made by Baden-Powell, the founder of the Scouts, on his sojourn in Africa, 
dampers, I understood, were hard baked discs of unleavened flour. But when I sought for flour in our kitchen, I found the flour bin as it happened empty. I did not want to ask if there was more flour or go out and buy some. After all, we were supposed to be resourceful and self-sufficient. So I looked around further and then, to my pleasure, discovered some cement outside <laughs> left by builders who had been constructing a wall. Uh, I cannot now reconstruct the mental process by which I persuaded myself that cement would do instead of flour. <laughs> but I took some cement, made it into a paste, flavored it with garlic, <laughs> shaped it into a damper-like oval, and baked it in the oven. It became hard, very hard. <laughs> but then dampers were very hard. When I brought it to the cub meeting the next day and handed it to Mr. Barron, the scoutmaster, he was astonished, but I think gratified or intrigued by its weight, the unusually heavy nourishment it promised. He put it into his mouth and sank his teeth into it <laughs> and was rewarded with a loud cracking as one of his teeth broke. He instantly spat the thing out there were one or two twitters and then an awful silence. Everyone in the wolf pack looked at me. <laughs> How did you make the damper, Sax? Mr. Barron asked, his voice menacingly quiet. What did you put in it? I put cement, sir, I said. <laughs> I couldn't find any flour. The silence deepened, <laughs> extended. Everything seemed to freeze in a sort of motionless tableau. Struggling to control himself, and I think not to hit me, Mr. Barron made a short, impassioned speech. I had seemed quite a nice boy, he said, decent enough, though shy, incompetent, a terrible bungler, but this business of the damper now raised very deep questions. Did I realize what I was doing? Was it my intention to harm? Was I just incredibly stupid? Was I vicious or perhaps insane? Whatever the case, I had grossly misbehaved. I had injured my master, betrayed the ideals of the wolf pack. I was not fit to be a scout, and with this, Mr. Barron summarily expelled me. So that was the end of my scouting days. You know, I've always tried to belong one way or another. I've spent a lifetime trying to belong, but somehow or other, I think there must be some ambivalence. There's always some sabotage, and uh, thing, things like this happen. So I've been thrown out of every community I've tried to belong in. Um, uh, the, um, uh, more seriously, I am, um, although I don't know whether seriously is the right word, I, um, I now had a lot to do with two uncles my chemistry uncle, Uncle Tungsten, Uncle Dave, and a physics uncle, Uncle A.B. Um, uh, both of them were not only interested in science, but in the history of science and in the personalities. Um, uncle Dave would tell me about the Swedish apothecary, Shela, who had, in the 1780s, found tungstic acid and molybdic acid um, and Shaler was a sort of hero for him and then became a sort of hero for me. Um, so science and technology were never presented to me, were, were essentially were presented in a human way, as part of the human adventure, as part of culture. And, um, and I was given a, a lovely book called The Discovery of the Elements, and this was very important for me so that chemistry was associated for me, science was associated with storytelling, with personalities, with personal involvement, um, and also with original accounts. At that time, there, were, there was a delightful series called the Alembic Reprints, and there you could read Humphrey Davy or Liebig or Shaler, the original account, and that was very, very important. I think it is very important. Um, and so I didn't start with textbooks. I sort of started 
at the beginning. Um, I, I, I'm not about to do an experiment, although I, 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 I feel slightly like this. Um, incidentally, um, uh, you call it H2O, but the formula was thought of as HO till 1860. Um, and um, you think drinking water in public is, is easy? <laughs> You know, you, you begin to think of, of, of all the things which, which, which could go wrong and sort of um, ending up, of course, with, with choking. And if you choke, then, then you, you, you die apologizing. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's very, very... Okay, it's better. Um... um um, incidentally, um, in terms of popular science of the very best sort, I don't know if it's been translated into Dutch, but there is a wonderful book by Philip Ball uh, called H2O. It's, it's a marvelous sum. Um, and H2O, of course, isn't just water, but it's steam and it's ice and it's, it's H2O. Um, the, um, once um, I had seen something of chemical transformations. I wanted a laboratory of my own. Um, in the 1940s, it was easy for a boy or girl to get any chemical they wanted. Um, and I had quite an elaborate laboratory. My parents were very supportive. They allowed me to take over a room at the back of the house and to fill it with um, what would now be called dangerous substances of every sort. Occasionally, um, and they were very cool when things went wrong. Once I filled the house with hydrogen sulfide, which of course is, is very poisonous as well as, as very foul smelling, but then they just insisted that I have a fume cupboard, a hood. Um, they also insisted that I wear goggles sometimes. And if, if something was, got too violent and was out, about to explode, I could always run out and throw it on the lawn outside. Uh, and gradually the lawn developed charred and discolored patches. Um, my parents had been very proud of the lawn uh, at one point, uh, but in 1940 in the Blitz, it was half destroyed by incendiary bombs, and in 1944, I finished it off. <laughs> and, and the, um, the, um, no, I think my first love of chemistry was sensuous. I loved the colors, the smells, uh, the transformations. Um, even simple transformations uh, seemed quite magical to me. Some of these had been shown to me when I was very young, like I'm sure you've all done this. If you pour ammonia on red cabbage, it turns green. Uh, you mustn't eat it then, but it's, um, although if you pour vinegar, it turns back to red. Um, but I... Um, I was very fascinated at first by the colors and the textures. I was fascinated by minerals. I was fascinated by constancies. I wondered, why are all manganese minerals and salts pink? Why are nickel ones green? Um, uh, why, if you put ordinary salt or any sodium compound in a flame, does it color the flame yellow? Or if you put a strontium compound in the flame, it colors it red. Um, so I think under the surface of phenomena, of these beautiful, varied phenomena, I was, I was hoping for some sense and some rules and some laws. Um, and above all, I was attracted to elements. Um, uh, my uncle once showed me that if you mix together a strong acid with a strong alkali, hydrochloric acid with caustic soda, well, either of these alone would burn your stomach out. But he put them together, the mixture grew, well, it all grew very hot, and then he said, drink it. And I, you know, having had an insane headmaster, I wondered if I now had an insane uncle. Um, but of course, I trusted him, 
and of course it was only salt, it was only brine. But it was necessary that the acid and the alkali be put together in exactly the right proportions. And this, I think, gave me a sense of, uh, um, of atoms and atoms with different weights and all that. Um, elements, for me, now became what prime numbers had been earlier. They were invariant, they were solid, they were indivisible, they were incorruptible. And if numbers were the building blocks of, um, if prime numbers were the building blocks of numbers, then elements were the building blocks of the universe. I, um, I love them and I, I like to carry them around with me. I would have little, little lumps of, of bismuth and tungsten and all sorts of things. Um, I knew that elements came in certain families, but I sometimes wondered how they were all related, or if they were all related. And for me, an absolute revelation or epiphany was seeing the periodic table. Now, at this point, I'm sorry I don't have one, but of course you, you all have it in mind. Um, the, I think I'm going to read a little bit. So, um, when I was um, 12, the Science Museum opened just after the war, and there they had an enormous periodic table. It covered half, half a wall, and it had samples of all the elements. And as I, I already knew quite a lot of chemistry, but everything was brought together by the periodic table. The periodic table was incredibly beautiful, the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. I could never adequately analyze what I meant here by beauty. Simplicity, coherence, rhythm, inevitability, or perhaps it was the symmetry, the comprehensiveness of every element firmly locked into place with no gaps, no exceptions, everything implying everything else. I could scarcely sleep for excitement the night after seeing the periodic table it seemed to me an incredible achievement to have brought the whole vast and seemingly chaotic universe of chemistry to an all-embracing order. And it gave me for the first time a sense of the transcendent power of the human mind and the fact that it might be equipped to discover or decipher the deeper secrets of nature, to read the mind of God. Um, now, I was sort of uncertain as to whether the periodic table was, a, was an invention, a human invention, an invention by, of Mendeleev, the great Russian chemist, or whether it was a discovery. I didn't know whether the periodic table was in here or out there. And, um, and although I'd sort of become a little atheist in my, at an earlier age, which is another story, I think I somehow confused Mendeleev with Moses. Um, and I imagine Mendeleev going up to some chemical cyanide and coming down with the, <laughs> with the tablets of the periodic law. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether this has to, to do with being Jewish or whether it's a, a universal. Uh, there, was, there was a tremendous hunger for law. Um, not moral law, but I think cosmic law. And, um, and the periodic table was, was a tremendous wonder to me, and a confirmation that the physical universe at least made sense and could, and could be depended on. Whereas I wasn't too sure about the human universe, especially after the capricious and deranged headmaster at school. Um, uh, you know, one strives for stability and, and order and reassurance one way and another. And I think this was especially strong for me in the war. I was just six when the uh, war broke out. And when I returned to London, it was different in all sorts of ways. Um, people had left the house. People had been killed. Buildings had vanished. Uh, and um, I, I wanted evidence of one sort or another. Um, I want a sort of historical evidence. It was about, at this time, 
that I became very interested in photography. My little laboratory doubled as a darkroom, and I wanted to, to document uh, events, places, people, moments. I, um, I vividly remember taking a photo from my bedroom window on my 12th birthday. I wanted to show, I wanted to document how Mapesbury Road looked on the 9th of July, 1945. Now, I did so, and I... But by a paradox now, I can no longer remember how Mapesbury Road looked. I can only remember how the photo looks. I think this is one of the, the dangers of, of a sort of selection. I started keeping journals at this time. Um, I wanted to chronicle. Um, I became interested in, in old things and archaeology. I became interested in fossils. Fossils were a guarantee that the earth had been here for, for a long time. Um, no, oops. Um, um, uh, so, one starts with, with an interest in, in the macroscopic world, the visible world, the world of the senses, the world which you can touch and feel and smell. Um, and then, but you realize you can't understand, on the whole, the, the macroscopic world in its own terms. One has no idea why, why chemicals should combine, or combine in particular ways. And one is driven to the invisible world. Here one is driven to the notion of atoms. Um, uh, the notion of atoms was partly forced on me, uh, as it was forced on Dalton, by the, the fact of fixed combinations. But it was also forced on me by another great delight, which was a spectroscope. Um, now, my physics uncle um, was very, um, well, he had a wonderful magical loft which was full of, of electrical machines and vacuum tubes and fluorescent paints and, uh, and all sorts of things. Um, but he also was very interested in history and he gave me a book called The Spectroscope. It was an 1872 book. And all my reading at this time was, was already out of date. There was Chemical Recreations, which had been published in, originally in the 1820s. There was the Playbook of Metals. You know, so, um, so all this was adventure and all this was fun. And in the spectroscope, uh, the author, well, maybe I can read a little bit if I can find it. Um, by a man called Lockyer. I have little doubt, Lockyer wrote at the end of his book, that as time rolls on, the spectroscope will become the pocket companion of everyone amongst us. A small spectroscope became my own constant companion, my instant analyzer of the world, whipped out on all sorts of occasions to look at the new fluorescent lights that were beginning to appear in London tube stations, to look at solutions and flames in my lab, or at coal fires or gas flames in the house. And when I was writing this book, I not only tried to reconstruct, I had to relive things. And as I was writing this, I started to carry around another pocket spectroscope, as I'd done 50 years earlier. And um, I actually strongly recommend this to all of you. Um, uh, just yesterday, with my publisher, I was wandering around Amsterdam uh, looking, looking at the different lights, which have wonderfully different spectra, at um, sodium fluorescent lights and sodium lights and neon lights and tungsten lights. And um, one thing I will have to recommend, which is at the corner of Herrenhacht, I can't pronounce these things, of Herrenhacht and Leidsestraat, there is a pin automat. And above it, there are two sodium lights, wonderful yellow lights. And if you look at them, you see a brilliant yellow line, which is the emission line of excited sodium atoms. I think this will mean a lot to you. And um, um, uh, since I've been talking this way, I think the sale of spectroscopes <laughs> has, has surged. But really, it's, it's a wonderful, 
it's a wonderful sort of thing. Um, the um, uh, and um, and spectroscopes will not only identify the element, um, but they give you some idea of the complexity of the atom. For example, the spectrum of iron has something like 500 lines. And this caused people around 1870 to realize, even though no one had seen an atom, that an atom wasn't a solid little ball, but it must be immensely complex. People said an atom has to be as complex as a grand piano. Incidentally, I think it's fascinatingly fascinating how quickly um, scientific discoveries get into the general culture. Three or four years after the spectroscope was introduced, Dickens, in our mutual friend, talks about a moral spectroscopy whereby the inhabitants of another planet might look at the light from the Earth and decide what sort of species we are. Um, the well, um, everything came together for me, finally, in a sort of uh, epiphany of, of order. I'm just going to read one little thing here from what is the most excited part of the book before it takes a, um, a nosedive at the end. God thinks in numbers. Auntie Len used to say, numbers are the way the world is put together. This thought had never left me, and now it seemed to embrace the whole physical world. I had started to read a little philosophy at this point, and Leibniz, so far as I could understand him, appealed to me especially. He spoke of a divine mathematics with which one could create the richest possible reality by the most economical means, and this, it now seemed to me, was everywhere apparent in the beautiful economy by which millions of compounds could be made from a few dozen elements and the hundred odd elements from hydrogen itself and the economy by which the whole range of atoms was composed from two or three particles and in the way that their stability and identity were guaranteed by the quantum numbers of the atom itself. All this was beautiful enough to be the work of God. Um, I think that if I had sort of given up or never had any sense of uh, of, of a personal God, somehow the, um, uh, uh, the order and beauty of the universe inspired a feeling which was not merely aesthetic, but I think you know, was somewhat mystical and had qualities of, of awe and so forth. And of course, being in Amsterdam, one should to think of Spinoza, who always identified God with, with nature. Um, the end of the book is called The, the End of the Affair, and this describes what for me was a, finally, a puzzling change that in my 15th year, roughly, I started to lose interest in my great passion. Um, and uh, um, although at the same time, life spread out in other ways. I, um, I'd been rather solitary between the ages of 10 and 14. Uh, chemistry was secret, I had my uncles and then myself books. Uh, then in adolescence came, I started to make friends, I started to get um, excited by, by organisms. Um, uh, first of all, invertebrates, and then vertebrates, and then mammals, and then human beings, and then particularly human beings. Um, I'm in amazing evolution. Um, and um, the, um, so in a way, the world became richer and healthier, and in another way, I think I, I lost something, which that sort of strange concentration and depth uh, which, which I'd had earlier disappeared. Maybe this is something just to do with, with, with aging. I think this sort of thing is not uncommon between the ages of, uh, you know, of 10 and 14. Um, now, I, um, I haven't been watching the time, and I should. Um, this book is equally interleaved with um, uh, stories of my parents, um, and if I had more time, I would read some of them to you. I think one I would particularly have read would be the pleasure of going out on house calls with my father. 
and seeing how, um, how he loved house calls and although he was very acute at diagnosing a disease, he would always see it in the whole context of a, of a life um, and, uh, um, and a family um, and, and even a particular period in, in culture or history. My parents were also both storytellers. My mother was an especially good storyteller. And I think sort of story and medicine became linked together for me at this early age. Um, uh, the, um, I don't quite know why I launched on this book. It was, um, it was a mistake. Uh, no, no, well, it wasn't, no it, was, it was an accident. And for a long while, I thought it was a mistake. And I thought I would never be able to bring it together. And also, the manuscript got longer and longer. And at one point, it was two million words, about two and a quarter million words. And then I had to take a red pen and strike out 95%. Um, uh, so what remains, obviously, is a selection, or distillation. Um, I, in some sense, I think I have um, the early days more in focus. And I think there's been a reconciliation of many, many sorts. Um, I regard the book now partly as a sort of thank you to my parents and to my uncles and even to the wicked headmaster because I think in their different ways they must all have contributed to, to what I am now. You know, Jonathan Miller, who's a close friend, has often said that if he wrote an autobiography, he would entitle it Influences. And in, the, in a sense, this is about influences. But having said this, I'm still rather puzzled as to what relation that little chemistry mad boy had to the later Oliver Sacks. Um, and um, I guess it should be explored in a volume two. <laughs> but I have no impulse whatever to write a volume two. And so I think at this point, I've said enough. Thanks very much. presentation and a hard deck to follow by an interview. I feel, I feel a bit embarrassed as well because I realize some of the people in this audience have read in the invitation that they would be allowed to, ah, there we go, would be allowed to ask questions and I'm the only one with that privilege tonight so I hope I at least mention some that, that some others here in the audience would have wanted to ask as well. Um, so may I start with, um, at the end, with, with, with a question that you raised and which came up to me with when I read your book is the relation between young Oliver and the person you are now. Um, and actually Max Perutz in his review, in the New York uh, uh, Review, um, asked that question and said to what extent is it actually not Uncle Tungsten but Uncle Oliver who has, who has made that boy. And, and so and the underlying question is how do we relate to what we were 55 years ago? And um, um, Max Brutz comes with the, with the um, analogy and says, isn't it like a bird who gets out of the egg and walks around and looks at the egg shells and says, I wasn't in there, that wasn't me. I wouldn't recognize that at all as, as what I was. So you, you've dived into yourself through all these tools of memories and, and recollections from others and your own recollections, but how, how close is that person to who you are now? Um, uh. Well, I will start again by saying, obviously, I, I don't know. Um, you know, there's an interesting letter which Freud wrote to uh, another analyst, um, Abraham, in, 19, in 1924, when he looks back on his own 
anatomical research on invertebrates 50 years before that. And he, um, and he wonders whether it could be the same person. He says, it strains the unity of personality to imagine that I was that person, yet I must be he. And he actually goes on to say that those early discoveries on invertebrates gave him more pleasure than any of his later discoveries uh, as an analyst. Um, but um, uh, um, some people, I think, can trace a clear trajectory or evolution or growth uh, in themselves. Uh, so for them, as it were, it may be clear that the child is father to the man. Um, for myself, I have a certain feeling of discontinuity. Mm -hmm. um, although I suppose, um, uh, I mean, I think I've always had sort of two loves. I think one love for the, the particular, the concrete, the diverse, the phenomenal, and another one for, for some sort of deep uh, principle. Um, now, in the nature of things, one, there are no or very few deep, simple principles in biology. It's all complexity and, and variation and vicissitude and contingency. Um, but, but I've got a strong taste for that as well. I, um, <laughs> and um, I think also that it was clear to me when I was maybe 14 or so that, um, that I couldn't be a real chemist. I really only wanted to be a 19th century chemist, mm -hmm. and that no longer made sense in the middle of the 20th century. And, um, but I think perhaps I thought that, that um, biology and medicine were still in a much more sort of natural history sort of stage. Um, but I think there was always an interest in um, individuals, whether they were numbers or elements or, or people. But I, but I can't give any clear answer. No, I, I, I'm trying to understand here because, because, um, because we're going to we're going to come to biology, but I want to stick with that because I think the discontinuity is fairly strong, mm -hmm. because um, the um, here's the young boy who's trying to 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 order everything, and what you mention in your book is that actually the disappointment maybe it's 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 just intellectualizing it after the fact because as you said it was just growing up and you became 15 years old and there were other things that interested you, but you you're also trying to rationalize it by saying that once the uncertainty principle came around and you realize that this whole ordered universe with all the elements where that could be explained in terms of the atoms and the atoms could be explained in, in terms of the atom number and all of a sudden right at the center of that was uncertainty you, you seem to lose your grip you became disappointed well, but was it was it a story that you afterwards realized that as an interesting story or is it would you say that's really fundamental that you you lost you realized the universe didn't make there were no certainties there. Um, well, I, I think that, that threw me uh, considerably. And I, um, and I sort of, uh, I, I partly wished Heisenberg hadn't opened his mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but then um, I, um, uh, I, I didn't think the uncertainty mattered that much at, at the level of, of chemistry. And I, and, and I don't think it matters that much. And, and I think one is, one is still on fairly, fairly solid ground, but, but it certainly did yeah. throw me for a while. Because somewhere in your book you mentioned that your mother introduced you and said, this is our youngest son, Oliver. Oliver wants to be a scientist. And you didn't become a scientist, you became a medical doctor, yeah. right? And, and, and um, yeah, um, I, I've, um, uh, yeah I, I've occasionally tried to become a scientist, but um, but things go wrong. Um, in, um, you know, in, um, in the movie of Awakenings, it portrays me as having spent seven years working on earthworms. And th th this isn't the case. I, I only spent one year. <laughs> um, but um, I, I was actually doing some neurochemistry and neuropathology and, um, uh, on the giant fibers of earthworms, and, and everything, everything went wrong. I was very clumsy. I, I, I once dropped some food in the, in the ultra centrifuge. Um, I, I lost a specimen I, I'd spent 10 months making. And finally, they said to me, you know, get out, sex. They said, you're, you know, you're, you're a menace. Go see patients. They, they, they matter less. Um, but, um, um, 
but I, I um, you know, I, I'm, I'm wistful about the scientific life, uh, yours, anyone's, and about the single-mindedness and concentration uh, which allows one to pursue a problem or, or an issue for years and years. The, the, the medical life, you're partly dependent on who knocks at the door, who phones you, who writes a letter, who gets referred, and so you, you seem to be catapulted in all directions. But, um, uh, but yet I think, um, under the multitude of directions, a, you know, a picture of the of what it is to be human and the human nervous system also starts, starts to develop. May I mention an experiment about worms? Let, let's, let's forget about these people. Let's talk about worms for, for, yes. for a few minutes. Right. So a, a, a graduate student in my lab did an experiment with worms really just two weeks ago in which he grew the worms on heavy nitrogen. So, so that's instead of 14 nitrogen, it's 15 nitrogen, right? So, and then he did a mass spec analysis and found out he, he grew them on heavy nitrogen for two um, days. They were, and they, they have a generation time of two weeks only. So the larvae were put on heavy nitrogen. Two days later, he gets out all the proteins and analyzes them by mass spec. As it turns out, 97% of the proteins had the heavy nitrogen in there, meaning that they were newly made. So from the, the worms he put on, only 3% remained. In other words, within two days, there was totally new, there were new beasts. There was no trace left of what there were two years ago, two, two, two days before. So here we are sitting, and I've never done the calculation, but there isn't much left of who we were 55 years ago, right? No, um, I, I, no. Um, no, 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 absolutely, I, I, and, and yet we, we are the same. We're, uh, and I imagine your earthworms were sort of the same in terms of, of memory and identity and behavior. I mean, and so far as earthworms yeah, yeah, have yeah. memory and identity and behavior. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I, I agree. This, uh, you know, th this is the other sort of wonderful stability. It's not, um, you know, um, you know, with an atom of tungsten, you can depend on it. It's there. It's always the same. But, but we've got this, this other sort of stability, yeah. we hope. So, so about biology, maybe, because maybe, that's another thing that intrigued me, because you were there as a boy, always trying to find the deeper, the deeper levels of understanding. And you're, and you're also interested in biology, you, you still are. I mean, today you went to the botanical gardens, right? And, and you, you, so you, you but, but in the biology, we have, we biologists, we have, we have deep laws as well, right? And there's no, and most boys were actually fascinated by those, by the idea of evolution. By the idea that we grew out, you know, the dinosaurs, that's a classic for, for boys. And you don't mention evolution at all. And it's just one of these deeper laws of biology, like the genetic code, which, which is made, not when you were a boy, but, but, but later on when you were a student, I guess, and um, DNA, and, and the fact that we all have the same genetic code. Uh, to what extent does that fascinate you? Because well, I don't find a trace of that in, in you. No, well, I, um, I was fascinated by evolution, and, and in particular by plant evolution. And I've partly talked about this in another book, uh, which was a reason why well, I couldn't quite repeat it here. Um, and also when I was 14 or so, I, with great audacity, impudence, with a friend, I, I called on Julian Huxley, uh -huh. the, the great, and we, we said we wanted to discuss evolution with him. Um, <laughs> um, but um, no, I, I was, um, say, in my own family, which was enormous, uh, because beside the, the 18 siblings, there were close to 100 first cousins and then second cousins, but there were certain features like the land or ear, these rather large ears, and the land or voice and so forth, which were constant and, as it were, the, uh, so to speak, the atoms of constancy, the genes which determine them, did, did intrigue me. But every cell in our body has an ancestor cell, and there's no dead ancestor until, until we go back all four billion years to the start of evolution, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a continuous chain from this cell in my finger to the cell that it divided off from, butted off from, all the way down to the first cell. Yeah. Is that, I mean, I find that the most wondrous idea. Right, um, no, no, no I, I agree, and if I, maybe if I get onto a volume two, I will, well, I, 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 I will deal with those wonders as well. This is gonna be the bottom line of this interview, I hope, yes, that I can convince you to write that book, of course. So, so, yeah, you, you mentioned it. You, you've been reading all of this in the original. 
Um, and you mentioned in the book as well, uh, Mendeleev and all these, these authors. Well, well, I mean, not, not in the Russian, in translation. No, 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 sure, okay. <laughs> but, um, which I don't think many of, of, of us in our generation would ever do. I, I read a little bit of Darwin in the original, and it's highly readable. Um, but, but to go back to, to most of the original books is not done anymore. You think that's valuable? People ought to um, do that. Um, well, I, it was valuable for me, and I think that some people need to do it. Um, I, um, I was fascinated, I quote a little of a, um, from a lecture by the chemist Kanazawa on the teaching of chemistry when he says that by suggestion and by experiment he will try and put his students back at the time of Lavoisier so they can experience the Lavoisian revolution as his contemporaries did and then, then at the time of Dalton. Um, um, I think some people need to have a strong historical sense and to read original sources, and, and perhaps others don't. Um, but uh, um, but you, uh, you spoke earlier about the difficulty of enlisting people in science and, and, uh, and the need to arouse wonder. And I think one way of doing this is to... Um, is to enter the wonder of figures in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you do that best in their original writings. Um, if you look at Humphrey, Humphrey Davies' diary, you see how he danced for joy around the lab after, you know, after, after discovering potassium. You, you, you can be there with him. You can enter his mind. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you spoke earlier about and kindly, or too kindly, about, uh, about the world being seen through my eyes for readers. But, but read the original sources and you will see the world through their eyes, mm -hmm. which you can never do in any description or paraphrase or textbook. Yeah, I, I find that with, with my graduate students, if I, if I read a paper of 10 years back, they think it's ancient, and there must be a funny reason for, for discussing that, right? So, so it, it is true that not a lot of people will do that at all. So we'll take that lesson at heart. Um, so let's, let's slowly make the transition from, 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 from atoms to, to chemistry and biology to, to the medical world, which of course is not part of this book, but it's still it's, it's, it's somewhere in between who you are now and what you were talking about and writing about. Um, you mentioned over dinner that the problem with writing a book about yourself is that people always want to know more. So just stop me if there's something where, you, where, you, where, 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 where I'm, I'm, I'm being nosy. You, I think the first mentally ill person you, you, you meet may have been your brother, Michael. Well, that is after the headmaster. But I was not in a position to make a judgment on him. Yeah, yeah. because you mentioned that Michael was, was maltreated. Um, yeah, well, my Michael, who was five years older than I was, was also at the school, Brayfield, and then went on from there I think to an even worse school, and um, I, I remember one episode when I was about 10 or 11 when he came out of the bathroom and an aunt of mine, with, he didn't he, he have his pajama jacket, jacket on, and an aunt of mine said, saw the wheels and the bruises on his body, uh, the signs of abuse if you want, and said if this is happening to his body, what's happening to his mind? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think my parents didn't pay too much attention to this, but soon after this, Michael became psychotic and, uh, and hallucinated, and he felt that a, uh, a magical and sometimes malignant world was closing in on him, but he also felt that he was perhaps the messiah. And, um, uh, and I was terrified at, at all this, partly because I could imagine what was going on, and I wondered whether this might be my future, and I think this was one thing which drove my concentration in chemistry, because I, want, I wanted to, to close, my, close the door and, and concentrate. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, there was just a, an intense sympathy for him. Yeah. What happened to him? Um, well, he recovered he from back. that uh, acute psychosis, um, and, uh, but it's been a, um, uh, a difficult life for him, although I think one which 
which he has handled with great uh, bravery and dignity and, and humor. Um, I, um, I, mean, I, I, I don't know whether all of us, if, if we are driven too far, will, will sort of go there. I think we can certainly all visit um, mad worlds in, in our dreams, but then that's what dreams are for, partly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you, you largely explain in this case, in his case, his mental illness, and in your case, your own physiological regular development by, by the early youth, right? That sounds very Freudian. Well, in your books, you, you, I mean, your first success that you describe in Awakenings was pretty, pretty physical, right? It was L-DOPA, mm -hmm. and, and it was a chemical that was working on the brain. Uh, you see that as a contradiction? Um, um, I, not, not really. It's sort, it's sort of, I think it sort of depends. I am um, obviously uh, one can think in purely biological terms in some cases, for example, with regard to, to color blindness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I'm, um, but I, I don't know whether mental illness, so-called, is uh, or schizophrenia, so-called, is a uh, is an entity. The man who coined the term Bloiler spoke of the group of schizophrenias. I think there probably always has to be some combination of a genetic disposition and a, uh, and a, a historical drive. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, so, so I think it's always important in so-called cases of mental illness, and, but also with something which is clearly biological, like Tourette syndrome or autism, but I think you have to look both at the historical and the chemical and, um, and deal with both of them. Young Oliver would probably have found it very messy and, and, to, and, and wouldn't have related to that at all, right, to that idea. That trying to understand the human brain would probably be a hopeless, a hopeless thing for young Oliver when he was 14 years old. Or yeah, so. it was too much. I mean, it still is too much. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but, 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 but now it seems to me the single most exciting thing, really? challenge in, in the yes. world. Yeah. Because you describe the, your, your first um, uh, encounters with Metzid, they were, were awful. Your, 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 your mother brought you dead embryos, human embryos, from abortion material from, and, and for you to, to look at. And when you were a 14-year-old boy, your first encounter, close encounter to a 14-year-old girl was that she was dead and you were supposed to dissect her. That, that sounds horrible. Oh, well, this was common in the 40s. No, 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 it wasn't. Um, no, um, I, I mean, there, there was an unfortunate accident in the latter thing. No, my mother had given me over to a, a colleague, uh, and, um, you know, and, and, and usually the cadaver is a sort of, is a sort of shrunken, sort of sexless senile, um, which I fear is what I may be becoming myself now. <laughs> I, you know, you know, and, and, and um, you know, and the fact that it was a, a juvenile and of my own age was was a sort of unfortunate. But um, no, my mother was a great enthusiast, and and, and um, I think she would forget. Um, I mean, I mentioned this a little bit. I, I read earlier when I, I when you bend the tin or zinc, it makes this funny noise that's crying. She says it's due to deformation of the crystal structure, forgetting I was five. Mm -hmm. And so she says, you know, I brought you a nice fetus today, you know, sort of <laughs> forgetting I was I was ten or eleven. Yeah. But also, you know, this um, um, uh, you can't apply the um, uh, the judgments of uh, of the present day. To 60 years ago. Well, that I realize, but 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 it's still true that even then you felt it, it was repulsive. Um, yeah, I, and medicine I, was nothing you wanted to do. To have um, uh, well, with. that was repulsive, and I, I I will I will confess that I've disliked anatomy ever since. Um, on the other hand, the medicine I saw when I went out with my father on house calls mm -hmm. was lovely, and I saw the warmth of it and the interest and how he entered into the whole situation. And so they were both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. is, is that part of the dichotomy there? Because what you also describe is that you, you, were, you were playing the piano and that you gave one concerto at some point, one recital, and the people loved it and you loved it. 
And, and if I see you here tonight, you, 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 you do interact with the audience quite a lot, right? So is, is there these two sides to your character? On the um, one hand, the, the shy person yes. trying to look at the, the numbers and the metals uh, and the elements, and on the other hand, the public? Yeah, yeah, very much. And this was also the case with my, with my mother, uh, who was morbidly shy, I think, in, in, in the company. Um, no, I, was, I was told a story once which, um, which brought out the other side. Um, uh, I'd, um, it was when I took my own first book to an editor, and the editor said, you know, we've met before. And I said, I, I can't remember. She said, you wouldn't. She said, it was like this. She said, I was a student of your mother's, and your mother, um, she said, was lecturing on breastfeeding that day. And after a while, she stopped and said, there's nothing difficult or embarrassing about this. And she bent down and retrieved a small baby which had been sleeping under the desk <laughs> and breastfed it before the class. And she said, this was in September 1933, and you were the baby. <laughs> Um, and I, I love the story about my mother because it shows the other public side of hers. She was sort of working the audience. Yeah. <laughs> As you are, yes. As I am, yes. 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 Um, yeah, there, there's so many questions to add because it's a long way between, between who you were, where, where you leave us at the age of 15 and, and, and where we are now. Um, you went to the United States of America. You, you seem very British. And you've, uh, still, you've lived in the Bronx for for 40 years now. Yeah. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know how much how much one changes. Um, I think um, uh, I really don't know what my identity is. You know, I, I once gave a talk in San Francisco, and someone asked me a question. He said, "Are you English or are you Jewish?" <laughs> and um, I said, "Both." He said, you can't be both, you've got to be, got to be one or the other. Um, actually, Robin Williams happened to be in the audience, and later, in, in an ultra-Jewish, ultra-English voice, he, <laughs> he gave a demonstration of how one, one might be both. Um, um, but I, I um, uh, you know, this may, may go back somewhat to um, the boarding school experiences. I once heard someone say that after this sort of experience, he said, um, it is difficult to bond, to belong, or to believe, mm -hmm. the three Bs. And um, I, I don't know that I feel particularly English or Jewish or American or, um, I, I guess I feel human, just about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so about, about your belief, there's a strong sense of God in all of this, and you, you, you take that analogy all of the time, right? You, when you talk about the, the periodic table, you say, you have the feeling you were, you were, what was the phrase? It was a quasi-religious feeling, is what you said, yeah. and, and you read the mind of God. And there's, that, that seems to be popular among American atheist biologists. Is um, to, yeah, Stephen yeah, J. Yeah. Colt uh, has yeah, yeah, just yeah. published a whole book um, along these lines. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, these are, these are only metaphors. Metaphors, yes. Yes. Right. yes, 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 yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Puts me at ease there. But, you know. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and um, I mean, uh, there's a difference between a metaphor and a symbol, which is, uh, you know, you, you, uh, a metaphor is a convenience, a symbol you, uh, you abide by, you believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, maybe, maybe as, as a final note, I, I don't think I fully understand still, and, and I, I, I think that's probably good, and I, I, maybe you don't quite understand still how you came from this boy with the chemicals. To, to who you are now, and, and especially this, the end of the story and how you entered into neurology. I do think it deserves a new book. So are you writing a new book? Are you planning to write a new book? Um, oh, well, I, um, I have some, some books in mind. Um, I have actually already written one which will come out in the spring, but which is an entirely different one. It's just a journal of a, of a visit to Mexico with botanists because I've indicated botany was another love of mine. Uh, but after that, I think I will go back. I may go back to the book on aging, mm -hmm. which I had in mind, or maybe just a, a book of case histories. Um, whether I will go back to this, I don't know. I mean, strangely, um, I think there was a rather bad time between about 15 and 32 or 33, uh, which partly had to do with endless school and endless submission. 
and I think I didn't feel a free agent again until I started to see patients in my own way. And in a strange way, um, so this for me was another awakening, I would quite like to write a volume three, but omit a volume two. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Well, well let's, let's, let's look forward to volume three then. You're still seeing patients, aren't oh, you? Yes, uh, for about half the working week. Yeah. Really, really? Okay, well, I wish you very much luck with that. I want to wish you luck with your writing. I hope, as I think I speak on behalf of all of us, that we're looking forward to many books still, volume three and four and whatever there is yeah. to come. I want to thank you very much for your uh, presence here and your presentation and the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachs. Thank you so much, Ronald Plasterk. It was a very interesting, I think, insight in your boyhood and from the comfort of numbers, we came to your mother and the three Bs and I think much more to think of. Um, Dr. Sachs will sign books, I think, in this beautiful auditorium, a former church. And there will, there's always, there's always, there's also some books of Mr. Plasterk to be signed. Sorry. Um, Dr. Sex and um, the publisher asked us to, if you wanted him to sign the books that you write your name in very clear letters so that he doesn't have to see in <laughs> and start writing. And the jazz band you've heard before, they will play on, on the first floor. You can have drinks there too if you have to wait too long in line. And one more thing I would like to say before we really close off. Um, there will be another lecture this week, as Dr. Sachs already mentioned. It on, it's on Thursday the 13th. Deborah Tannen will speak about her latest book, I Only Say This Because I Love You, in the auditorium of the University of Amsterdam. Tickets can still be uh, reserved for this lecture. And on January 10th, we will start um, the new program, the new year with the National Book Award winner, Jonathan Frensen, in the Rode Hood. We will bring a special program on civil rights for Dutch schools on February 13th. And we've just been informed that American author Chang Ray Lee tipped us top 10 young authors in the US will be our guest on February 28th. If you're interested in our programs, please, again, fill in the form <laughs> in the coupon and your brochure. We do need your support. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you also our volunteers who worked us for us tonight here in the Kuppelkerk. Thank you so much and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.